One of the big success factors here at Spotify is our agile engineering culture. Culture tends to be invisible. We don't notice it because it's there all the time, kind of like the air we breathe. But if everyone understands the culture, we're more likely to be able to keep it and even strengthen it as we grow. So that's the purpose of this video. When our first music player was launched in 2008, we were pretty much a scrum company. Scrum is a well-established agile development approach and it gave us a nice team-based culture. However, a few years later, we had grown into a bunch of teams and found that some of the standard scrum practices were actually getting in the way. So we decided to make all this optional. Rules are a good start, but then break them when needed. We decided that agile matters more than scrum and agile principles matter more than any specific practices. So we renamed the scrum master role to agile coach because we wanted servant leaders more than process masters. We also started using the term squad instead of scrum team and our key driving force became autonomy. So what is an autonomous squad? A squad is a small, cross-functional, self-organizing team, usually less than eight people. They sit together and they have end-to-end -end responsibility for the stuff they build. Design, commit, deploy, maintenance, operations, the whole thing. Each squad has a long-term mission, such as make Spotify the best place to discover music, or internal stuff like infrastructure for A-B testing. Autonomy basically means that the squad decides what to build, how to build it, and how to work together while doing it. There are, of course, some boundaries to this, such as the squad mission, the overall product strategy for whatever area they are working on, and short-term goals that are renegotiated every quarter. Our office is optimized for collaboration. Here's a typical squad area. The squad members work closely together here with adjustable desks and easy access to each other's screens. They gather over here in the lounge for things like planning sessions and retrospectives. And back there is a huddle room for smaller meetings or just to get some quiet time. Almost all walls are whiteboards. So why is autonomy so important? Well, because it's motivating and motivated people build better stuff. Also, autonomy makes us fast by letting decisions happen locally in the squad instead of via a bunch of managers and committees and stuff. It helps us minimize handoffs and waiting so we can scale without getting bogged down with dependencies and coordination. Although each squad has its own mission, they need to be aligned with product strategy, company priorities, and other squads. Basically, be a good citizen in the Spotify ecosystem. Spotify's overall mission is more important than any individual squad. So the key principle is really be autonomous, but don't sub-optimize. It's kind of like a jazz band. Although each musician is autonomous and plays his own instrument, they listen to each other and focus on the whole song together. That's how great music is created. So our goal is loosely coupled, but tightly aligned squads. We're not all there yet, but we experiment a lot with different ways of getting closer. In fact, that applies to most things in this video. This culture description is really a mix of what we are today and what we are trying to become in the future. Alignment and autonomy may seem like different ends of a scale, as in more autonomy equals less alignment. However, we think of it more like two different dimensions. Down here is low alignment and low autonomy, a micromanagement culture, no high level purpose, just shut up and follow orders. Up here is high alignment, but still low autonomy. So leaders are good at communicating what problem needs to be solved, but they're also telling people how to solve it. High alignment and high autonomy means leaders focus on what problem to solve, but let the teams figure out how to solve it. What about down here then? Low alignment and high autonomy means teams do whatever they want and basically all run in different directions. Leaders are helpless and our product becomes a Frankenstein. We're trying hard to be up here, aligned autonomy and we keep experimenting with different ways of doing that. So alignment enables autonomy. The stronger alignment we have, the more autonomy we can afford to grant. That means the leader's job is to communicate what problem needs to be solved and why, and the squads collaborate with each other to find the best solution. One consequence of autonomy is that we have very little standardization. When people ask things like, which code editor do you use? Or how do you plan? The answer is mostly, depends on which squad. Some do scrum sprints, others do Kanban. Some estimate stories and measure velocity, others don't. It's really up to each squad. Instead of formal standards, we have a strong culture of cross-pollination. When enough squads use a specific practice or tool, such as Git, that becomes the path of least resistance, and other squads tend to pick the same tool. Squads start supporting that tool and helping each other, and it becomes like a de facto standard. This informal approach gives us a healthy balance between consistency and flexibility. Our architecture is based on over a hundred separate systems coded and deployed independently. There's plenty of interaction, 
but each system focuses on one specific need, such as playlist management, search, or monitoring. We try to keep them small and decoupled with clear interfaces and protocols. Technically, each system is owned by one squad. In fact, most squads own several, but we have an internal open source model and our culture is more about sharing than owning. Suppose squad one here needs something done in system B and squad two knows that code best. They'll typically ask squad two to do it. However, if squad two doesn't have time or they have other priorities, then squad one doesn't necessarily need to wait. We hate waiting. Instead, they're welcome to go ahead and edit the code themselves and then ask squad two to review the changes. So anyone can edit any code, but we have a culture of peer code review. This improves quality and more importantly, spreads knowledge. Over time, we've evolved design guidelines, code standards, and other things to reduce engineering friction, but only when badly needed. So on a scale from authoritative to liberal, we're definitely more on the liberal side. Now, none of this would work if it wasn't for the people. We have a really strong culture of mutual respect. I keep hearing comments like, my colleagues are awesome. People often give credit to each other for great work and seldom take credit for themselves. Considering how much talent we have here, there is surprisingly little ego. One big aha for new hires is that autonomy is kind of scary at first. You and your squad mates are expected to find your own solution. No one will tell you what to do. But it turns out, if you ask for help, you get lots of it, and fast. There's genuine respect for the fact that we're all in this boat together and need to help each other succeed. We focus a lot on motivation. Here's an example, an actual email from the head of people operations. Hi everyone. Our employee satisfaction survey says 91% enjoy working here and 4% don't. Now that may seem like a pretty high satisfaction rate, especially considering our growth pain. From 2006 to 2013, we've doubled every year and now have over 1,200 people. But then he continues. This is of course not satisfactory and we want to fix it. If you're one of those unhappy 4%, please contact us. We're here for your sake and nothing else. So good enough isn't good enough. Half a year later, things had improved and satisfaction rate was up to 94%. This strong focus on motivation has helped us build up a pretty good reputation as a workplace. But we still have plenty of problems to deal with. So yeah, we need to keep improving. Okay, so we have over 50 squads spread across four cities. Some kind of structure is needed. Currently, squads are grouped into tribes. A tribe is a lightweight matrix. Each person is a member of a squad as well as a chapter. The squad is the primary dimension, focusing on product delivery and quality, while the chapter is a competency area, such as quality assistance, agile coaching, or web development. As squad member, my chapter lead is my formal line manager, a servant leader focusing on coaching and mentoring me as engineer, so I can switch squads without getting a new manager. It's a pretty picture, huh? Except that it's not really true. In reality, the lines aren't nice and straight, and things keep changing. Here's a real life example from one moment in time for one tribe. And of course, it's all different by now. And that's okay. The most valuable communication happens in informal and unpredictable ways. To support this, we also have guilds. A guild is a lightweight community of interest where people across the whole company gather and share knowledge within a specific area. For example, leadership, web development, or continuous delivery. Anyone can join or leave a guild at any time. Guilds typically have a mailing list, biannual on conferences, and other informal communication methods. Most organizational charts are an illusion, so our main focus is community rather than hierarchical structures. We've found that a strong enough community can get away with an informal, volatile structure. If you always need to know exactly who is making decisions, you're in the wrong place. One thing that matters a lot for autonomy is how easily can we get our stuff into production. If releasing is hard, will be tempted to release seldom to avoid the pain. That means each release is bigger and therefore even harder. It's a vicious cycle. But if releasing is easy, we can release often. That means each release is smaller and therefore easier. To stay in this loop and avoid that one, we encourage small frequent releases and invest heavily in test automation and continuous delivery infrastructure. Release should be routine, not drama. Sometimes we make big investments to make releasing easier. For example, the original Spotify desktop client was a single monolithic application. In the early days, with just a handful of developers, that was fine. But as we grew, this became a huge problem. Dozens of squads had to synchronize with each other for each release, and it could take months to get a stable version. 
Instead of creating lots of process and rules and stuff to manage this, we changed the architecture to enable decoupled releases. Using Chromium Embedded Framework, the client is now basically a web browser in disguise. Each section is like a frame on a website and squads can release their own stuff directly. As part of this architectural change, we started seeing each client platform as a client app and evolved three different flavors of squads, client app squads, feature squads, and infrastructure squads. A feature squad focuses on one feature area, such as search. This squad will build, ship, and maintain search-related features on all platforms. A client app squad focuses on making release easy on one specific client platform, such as desktop, iOS, or Android. Infrastructure squads focus on making other squads more effective. They provide tools and routines for things like continuous delivery, A-B testing, monitoring, and operations. Regardless of the current structure, we always strive for a self-service model. Kind of like a buffet. The restaurant staff don't serve you directly. They enable you to serve yourself. So we avoid handoffs like the plague. For example, an operations squad or client app squad does not put code into production for people. Instead, their job is to make it easy for feature squads to put their own code into production. Despite the self-service model, we sometimes need a bit of sync between squads when doing releases. We manage this using release trains and feature toggles. Each client app has a release train that departs on a regular schedule, typically every week or every three weeks, depending on which client. Just like in the physical world, if trains depart frequently and reliably, you don't need much upfront planning. Just show up and take the next train. Suppose these three squads are building stuff and when the next release train arrives, features A, B and C are done while D is still in progress. The release train will include all four features, but the unfinished one is hidden using a feature toggle. It may sound weird to release unfinished features and hide them, but it's nice because it exposes integration problems early and minimizes the need for code branches. Unmerged code hides problems and is a form of technical debt. Feature toggles let us dynamically show and hide stuff in test as well as production. In addition to hiding unfinished work, we use this to A-B test and gradually roll out finished features. All in all, our release process is better than it used to be, but we still see plenty of improvement areas, so we'll keep experimenting. This may seem like a scary model, letting each squad put their own stuff into production without any form of centralized control. And we do screw up sometimes, but we've learned that trust is more important than control. Why would we hire someone who we don't trust? Agile at scale requires trust at scale. And that means no politics. It also means no fear. Fear doesn't just kill trust, it kills innovation. Because if failure gets punished, people won't dare try new things. So let's talk about failure. Actually, no, let's take a break. Get on your feet, get some coffee, let this stuff sink in for a bit, and then come back when you're ready for part two, okay?